I have to do Leave an intro. Clap. Yeah. And go. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome to another episode. <laughs> Sorry, I'll start again. Hi guys. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Interval Conversations. I'm glad to be joined today by my friend, Mr. Todd Wilson. Todd, how are you doing? I'm all right, mate. How are you? I'm very good. Now, uh, you'll probably recognise Todd on your Facebook at the moment from doing live stream concerts from his house. Or if you've been to see shows in Calder Valley in Halifax, you'll recognise Todd's face. Or if you're from Liverpool, even, you'll recognise his face. So, uh, Todd, I, I just wanted to start off by talking about Andram days because yeah. I've known you god what well I was trying to work this out before I came on it depends what how old you were when you moved on to the on to said estate well I I was born in 96 and we moved there in 2000 I think it was no 2000, I was there 2001 I remember you guys moved on, not, so maybe it was 2001. 2001. You, you guys moved on not long after we were all set up. That, yeah. so I remember there was a big feud between the kind of new people that moved on <laughs> and the people that had already lived there. But yeah, man, so God, that's still nearly 20 years. Yeah. That's bonkers. Still putting up with each other. Well, <laughs> don't know if we even do put up with each other anymore. <laughs> we, 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 we just tolerate. Where to go. <laughs> Just wait till we stop recording. We're swearing at each other, and I know I'm being a, I'm being a good boy. This is a this is a, a professional podcast. Not don't use naughty words. Yeah, uh, another thing as well. Um, Todd also runs the um, Day Drinkers podcast. Yes. So I I did try filming with Will, and uh, it it just didn't work. So gonna have to refilm it. The big Willy. The big Willy. He, he's, he's, he, he's the one that runs the podcast. I just turn up and talk, drivel <laughs> for an hour. Um, got another little crossover episode. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're all we're all very incestuous, aren't we, really? We just cross yeah. over into all different groups. And, yeah. well, I, I, look how many, I, I know you from so many different walks of life mm. that we both are in naturally. You know, like, so like we, we both lived on the same estate growing up, yeah. but we both went there independently, if that makes sense. Our families moved there. And then we both stumbled across each other at Latter Pro Juniors in a way. Yeah. Because we both found, you know, you knew your people, I knew my people. Yeah. Then we bumped into each other again at the Halifax Amateurs, where we both found our own way there. Then Circle Lounge. It's just weird, yeah. like, yeah. It's never like we recommend each other. Do you know no. what I mean? It, it just always, we always end up in the same places. And another one, Small Words. Small and Words Small are words as well, yeah. Small Words are. Shout out to Patrick. Big shout out to Patrick. I just yeah I I, um, I need to message back into my little group actually with himself and uh, Adam the lead guitarist. Oh yeah. Um, we we've been trying to organise a quiz for like four weeks and none of us have done anything about it. <laughs> it's just the pinnacle of our friendship really. But life of a quiz master. I know the amount of quizzes lockdown has brought about. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the Friday night quiz we we're going completely off topic, but I don't care. It's a good episode. That's what podcasts do. Yeah. What, what are you drinking? Just a Diet Pepsi, mate. I'll hold it up so you get a bit of sponsorship. Oh, hang on, hang on. Lower it down, lower it down. There's your thumbnail. There we go. <laughs> is it Coke or is it Pepsi? Depends who it wants to Pepsi. give me more money. It is a Pepsi, I'm afraid. But I feel I feel Pepsi's got a warmer heart, so might be more likely to sponsor Same the company. Little podcast. <laughs> Same company. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. They just appear to be nicer. Yeah, <laughs> I fell for it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so sort of straight back to the podcast, as we've touched upon, it, we've both done Amdram yeah. over the years. So how did you get your start in that area of performing? Um, so my, my family are one of those kind of stalwart families that have just kind of been around in Amdram for years. I mean, my granddad used to be the... Uh, chairman or the president of light opera yeah. in like the 60s and 70s um my grandma was the uh, treasurer and then uh, a life member um 
my mum and dad did it. I mean, mum was, you know, had quite a few starring roles in kind of the 80s and early 90s before me and my sister came along and ruined her body, <laughs> as she says. Um, That's what my mum says. My, um, yeah, mum, mum and dad met on stage. Apparently dad carried her across the stage and kissed me Kate. Um, and they fell in love and they've been in sweet love ever since. They're still in Germany? Uh, they're in France now. Oh, France. They live in uh, yeah, a lovely little um, farmhouse in France. It's all very fancy. Oh. Uh, yeah, so then uh, then my sister always did kind of the junior societies, but I was always a bit more nervous of performing. I enjoyed kind of like school shows and stuff. Yeah. Um, I remember I got the I got the chance to I could be a munchkin um, at one point. I think the highest Ethan, of honours. I think he I think Ethan talked about the exact same show. You know. Um, when you interviewed him, um, but I didn't want to do it. I was scared to do it because um, I was scared of getting on stage. I also, when my sister used to do pantomimes, she'd always try to get me up the song sheet, and I used to hate going up for that as well. Yeah. Um, I remember once we went to go see um, a great former from Halifax. who was a good friend of mum and dad's, a guy called John Gulley. Um, went on to be a really successful actor, still doing stuff. He um, he performed as King Rat in Nottingham. <laughs> Yeah, and mum and dad had tried to get me to you know go do the song sheet, and I didn't. And then obviously the kids got like a little gift bag. <laughs> My dad, being brutal, went, "Oh, it looks like there's some Playmobil in those gift bags as well." So I was absolutely devastated because I was like, "Oh, I could have had Playmobil." Oh. Uh, to be honest, for a second I thought you were going to say something else. Uh. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but yeah, so I was always really devastated. And then and then through school, carried on with the school shows, yeah. and eventually. Uh, found my way to Calder Valley Youth Theatre when I was uh, 15. Um, but I never wanted to join the societies that my sister was part of, like Light Up the Juniors. Because um, I was always scared of kind of being Pippa's brother. Yeah. If that makes sense. Um, so it was quite nice, because I did eventually find my way there, but I found it through my own path sort of thing. But yeah, Calder Valley was the big kickstart for me, really. Yeah. Because uh, I know you did uh, Our House with them. First time. I did. That was my second show with them. So I did West Side Story in 2009. Um, and and then I did, yeah, Our House 2010. So I played Emo. That was the first time I, I did Our House. Yeah. Uh, before I did it with yourself at the Halifax Amateurs in 2013. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, Remember that stressful show week? <laughs> yeah, that was that was mad. I, I didn't, it, Ben Smith. If you're watching or listening, I've never seen you more angry than I did at that getting. Wow. I, um, yeah. But I've also never seen him more calm as to when he finally made the decision that we weren't going on opening night. Yeah, it, it was like this. It was a strange it was like a two minute that. rant, like just sweat. It's Brian Blessed level. I think even Brian would go, all right, calm down. <laughs> then he just carried on. It's like, well, let's do this. Okay. Yeah, he, um, it, he just planned such a brilliant set that we just didn't have the capacity to carry it off in time. We did yeah. carry it off eventually. We just the timing of when we could have got into the theatre and all that, from yeah. what I remember. And, uh, we, and I think it was, um, I won't name it, yeah, certain people missing from teams all right, for, okay. for a while. So I won't name any names. Um, no, I'm, I'm not in on the knowledge you've got there then. Yeah. So, but I'll probably have to cut that bit out. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, cut that bit out. So, um, have you got any personal highlights of shows? Oh, oh, God, yeah, loads. Um, I, the, the very first ever show that I ever did was, we were talking about this, the day I did Barnum yeah. when I was five. And uh, my mum always tells this story of just how uh, theatrical I was as a child. Um, apparently, a child. I, was, yeah, so I was five years old. I'm sat watching the TV and uh, local Halifax director Steve Tetlow rings up and says to mum, you know, we need somebody to come play Tom Thumb just to sit on a chair, thumb out. It, no, it was my left thumb. It was my left thumb, thumb out. That was all I had to do. And uh, mum walked into the living room and says to me, she says, um... Todd, would you like to uh, do a little part in a show? And I asked who was directing, and she said Steve Tetlow, and I said, oh, I'll do anything for Steve. Apparently, was how it came about. 
Um, <laughs> so that was how I got. So that's that's obviously a highlight. And uh, and then a little bit later, I did something at the Playhouse, another one, another one of our little places where we both ended up. Mm. Uh, I did Christmas Carol with my dad. My dad was Bob Cratchit, and I played Little Boy Cratchit. So that was a nice one, acting with my dad and rehearsing with my dad. And um, but yeah, then the the, the big standouts for me. Uh, the first time I did Our House was incredible. Um, mm. The joy of the joy of that show. Whoever whoever does it, it's just the music and the camaraderie you feel. Mm. The second time doing it was even more insane because of the scale. Yeah. It was twice the size of what we'd done as a youth theatre. Um, I'll always remember another you know, the final night. <clears throat> yeah. We had to cancel the opening night due to the yeah. set. So um, we've been talking about it all throughout the week. It's like, oh, should we do another encore on the final show? And we're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to do it. So we did the first, like, we did the encore, all in, like, the power position, like, yeah! Yeah. So we just heard... Ba -da -da, da -da -da -da. I was like, oh, for God's sake, not again. Exhausting. Exhausting. I literally crawled those stairs. I, um, one of the fun highlights for our house for me was uh, called the Valley. So, obviously, I played Emma. For anyone that doesn't know it, obviously, one of the two supporting male roles, friends. Uh, and he's kind of, he's kind of the really dumb one all the way through. And, and, um, and then there's a scene right towards the end where he uh, he takes his shirt off and they go, yeah, party or whatever. And the girls kind of go, oh, you've got a good body on you. And I was really body conscious as a teenager. Um, so I was always really nervous about that. And then on, on the last night, just before we went up to the finale, Sam said, um, the guy playing Lewis, he said, should we take his tops off in the finale? And I went, no, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. He said, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. So on the last night, he was like, you never know. Some girls might like catch his shirts and it will like get a girlfriend because that's what teenagers do, don't they? <laughs> so, anyway, we um we do it at the end, and obviously, right at the end, it finishes us on that na na na. <sighs> so, we took them, took them off as we're going forward, baggy trousers, and we're there topless, like these 17 year olds. And then we launched it out, and um, and sure enough, a girl caught Sam's. And if I remember right, while. One of the stage crew who happened to be watching Cotman, one of the blokes, big burly bloke, <laughs> and he walked, he walked down into the bar afterwards just holding it like that, Way! and I was like, oh, no. So that's a special highlight for me. Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, my first lead role, uh, or lead male role, was uh, Oscar in Sweet Charity at Calder Valley. That, that was that was nice. Unless you count the plan. We've been talking about the plan recently. Yeah, yeah, we talked about the plan. Uh, yeah, I voiced Audrey too, uh, in between those two shows, actually, at the um, at the playoffs for that for juniors. Um, so that was that was weird, because that that's a different one, isn't it? You know, you're not on stage, and, oh. you know, I kind of I, could I have it you up were, there. Um, the, I take it you were stage right in that little... I was stage right. Uh, Jed Moresco was operating the plan. Yeah. And all I had to do was stand at a microphone and feed me. <laughs> and I had, a I had a lovely little old lady who came up to me at the end of the show, in the bar. She went, oh, I thought you were excellent, but we were ever so certain you were black. Um, and I just I kind of went, well, how do you, is, is that cultural appropriation? Have I done something wrong there? Like, how do you respond to that question? <laughs> Um, so I do apologise to, to anybody. If I ever offended anybody with that performance, it wasn't intentional. Huh. Um, I, I'm just thinking, do I have to censor that out now? Uh, <laughs> no, I'll be right. Yeah. Well, yeah, say, edit it out, it'll be fine. Well, yeah, those, those are the... Calder Valley years. Wait hear some of the jokes Billy was coming out with just before oh, this. God. Jesus. The Calder Valley years were uh, definitely big highlight years for me. Yeah. But also, I'd say another special highlight was my directing debut in Halifax that you were in as yeah. well. At the Wellington Rooms. Um, oh, What a Lovely War was my first musical that I've ever directed. I directed plays with music. I directed plays where I'd MD'd as well. But that was the first one where it was a full-scale musical where there was dancing, singing. Uh, and it was hard. I mean, we, we talked about this on the phone yeah. the other night. It was, it was really hard for me with that. Um, but it was such an amazing company that I got to work with that it um, was definitely a highlight, definitely a highlight. Uh, and like I, was, uh, like I was saying to you on the phone, um, it's one of those shows that sort of pop up out of nowhere and it surprises you. Yeah. With how 
poignant it is, especially around the time we did it, because um, we did it the anniversary week. Yeah, and I was really unsure as to whether that was okay or not. If that makes sense, you know, I wasn't sure if it was kind of the right thing to do, but then it, it ended up being the right thing to do. Yeah, because we had that, uh, obviously it being around then, but it's also how funny the show was <laughs> as well, because like, it was different every night. And because uh, we had the brilliant uh, Keith Royston in the show as well, playing I've the seen. vicar. Yeah. And the opening night, I cracked. <laughs> And I just kept it in the second act because it got such a big laugh. Yeah. We're all sort of sat on boxes. Some people were facing centre stage. Some people were facing out. I was one of the people facing out. But I was directly across from Ben and Todd, who were working in the tech box we had. And Keith just sort of brought everything down to a quiet, let us pray. Go, oh go! <laughs> Is brilliant. That, that made me jump, and I just started cracking. I was like, "He just." And I, I, heard, I, I, I heard. I heard. I cried laughing every night. Uh, that he he's somebody that I didn't direct in that show at all no. because it. I I gave him I, I gave him stage directions, but he brings such a natural presence and charisma. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that that just proves it. Um, he he came in he came into that rehearsal room and as a latecomer and and lifted the kind of spirit of the cast because it was yeah. it was a really hard one to get off the ground because we didn't have enough cast members and people didn't know it and were unsure. Yeah. I was trying to direct in a completely different way to how Amdram directors normally do. You know, I was putting people out of the comfort zone um, and maybe also not doing it correctly either. You know, kind of coming in with just random ideas and going, "Oh, let's try this." And, I think my yeah. my kind of uh, messiness scared people, which yeah. I completely get. Yeah. Um, but then Keith came in, and it kind of, I think it, the people that were able to reach that level were then like, "Oh, I shouldn't be afraid of kind of letting go." Yeah. So they let go and got bigger, and then and then maybe people that were it was their first show or first couple of shows that were more nervous performers, mm. then kind of went, "Oh." Well, maybe I need to step my game, and then they'd start exploring things as well, and it just unlocked this these characters out of everybody that were amazing. But like yeah, that. he's um, he's a brilliant performer that I've been so lucky to work in a numerous uh, numerous capacities with. You know, I've I've acted with him, I've directed him, I've teched him, I've directed when he's been my techie. He's a very, very passionate sound engineer. He yeah. um, he loves providing. Um, sound clips for players and the like, you know, and, and I, I, I loved him working on Carrie's Wall because the, it's something in amateur theatre when a volunteer is taking on a, a tech role, there's no passion behind it. Yeah. Whereas the, the effort and research he put in as my uh, sound technician was incredible um, for Carrie's Wall that, that played. It, as well as having the brilliant Keith Royston in the show, <clears throat> We had, um, as we were saying, we had a cast of people who uh, you wouldn't usually cast as mains, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's people who... What I'd call it is, yeah, there were people that maybe hadn't necessarily had their chance to, to fully yeah. sparkle yet. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, and, that, and that is by no means a, a putting down of, no. of them at all because every single one of them was just a star in, in what the kind of one 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 person I, I will name check is uh, Georgina yeah who I remember the first meeting we had I wanted people to do improv and she was like give me this face to say I'm out of here she'd come down to do it as a favor to the society but that was way out of her comfort zone but then the characters she created were hilarious oh. um and as, but I, yeah, we could go go on and name check everybody in, in the cast because everybody yeah. was brilliant. Um, so if you're listening to this and you were in that company, thank you. you. Were amazing. Massive, massive <laughs> thank you to Sarah who, out of my messiness, helped us create a show as well. Um, so thank you, thank you. Uh, but yeah, def, definitely. I, I didn't realise until we started talking just how big a highlight for me that is in Amsterdam. But yeah, yeah, a huge highlight for me. 
Because I think what made that show good for me as well, as well as being in it, well, I, I rarely left the stage throughout yeah. it. But I also ended up being like the lighting tech, lighting designer. Oh, you, you helped me out. Uh, with the... Stage manager. <laughs> Mad, yeah. You helped, you, you helped do all the rigging of the lights and everything in, in mm. that. It's a really cool space is the Wellington yeah. Rooms. Uh, and I'm glad that they started to use it for more theatre. Yeah. But trouble is, when we did that show, up to that point, it'd always been end on. So literally, yes. audience on one side, performers there. But because we did it in Frost, I was like, yeah. well, we're going to have to design something. I went, and I, I think you and Ben were just talking like that. No, you, you and Paul were talking, I think it was. Okay. And you're like, oh, I don't know how you can do this. And I just put it in and went, well, you could put lights there in each corner. You could do a crossover there. And it yeah, was just sort of a... It isn't my expertise. Yeah. I was probably pretending to know what I was talking about. Just saying, oh, well, what I want is this. Yeah. And I put... somebody say, well, what you need to do is this. And I think after that, you both just went, go on. Gladly, gladly. And if that rig is still up, as far is as it? I know. That rig is still remember, up. You talk about it being end on, but I do remember seeing the last five years. That was um, done Yeah, that, that was in Traverse. Um, in Traverse. That was Traverse, yeah, well, yeah. but up, yeah. but after that, there was no other shows yeah. with it, so it was sort of, yeah, we, we were sort of first after that, and we're talking a couple of years. Yeah, I, I, performed, um, I performed one of the plays that I was in, one of the touring plays there, um, that was done end on, but it was really tricky to do end on, actually, in the welly rooms. Yeah. We needed more space than, than we had. Hmm. We, that was with Keith. Uh, I'm actually surprised how much more room we ha it felt we had doing yeah. it in Frost. We used such a small stage space to say there was... Yeah. How many of you was there? Was there about 10 of you? About 10, yeah. That's bonkers. Because when you look at the pictures, there was no space at all. I find a photo of it because. But the way we, uh, the way, the way we had the kind of aisles as well, it worked. Yeah, I, um, I, the part of the show that always shut me up was um, it was in Act oh, Two. What? Shut me up. Uh, <laughs> oh, I just realised what you mean. I was like, what? It was um, shut me up. Yeah, shut me up. <laughs> it was um, Act Two where I played a dead body. And I got dragged across the stage. Was it you that got dragged by Ben? Yeah. I just had a tea towel over my head. And he I can't remember me. who got dragged. For that was you. Because it was that part of Act 2 what was the most athletic for me. Because I literally did three laps on the stage. I go on one way, go off the other, then get dragged yeah. back on <laughs> same way, go back round. Still. Bonkers. Good, good I'd love Absolutely to do it again. Bonkers. Love to do it again. Yeah, do you know what? I'd 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 love to explore it again. It's um maybe I'd, I'd maybe give it another couple of years for myself. Oh, okay. I want to find the thing is when you do something for a second time you, you compare. Yeah. Um so I have a one of my lecturers from university has directed it something like thirty six times or something. Jesus. He's done it a ridiculous amount of times. I don't know if that number was a joke, but there is a, he's done it a, a heavy number of times. Yeah. Um, and I just think, God, your jokes must be stale. Yeah. Like, unless you literally find something different every single time. And the script is brilliant, and the script does encourage you to explore and, you know, improvise a little bit. And But... Um, yeah, you've got to be so careful with a, a piece like that because what you found funny in 2018 might not be hilarious in 2021. You know, it, things change and intonations change, and so. But yeah, I would, I would one day like to do it again, definitely. Um, so just moving on with the podcast before we yeah. start going into, we start recreating the show. <laughs> um, so you do a lot of. Oh, did a lot of gigs before this lockdown started. Yeah. Uh, would you like to tell everyone how you got your start in gigging? Yeah, so funnily enough, uh, I got a little notification a couple of days ago, and it has been officially eight years since my first 
solo gig that was just me on my own. Yeah. Um, but I'd always, I'd always kind of played guitar through kind of 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, I used to play it on holiday. I'd go and like, there was a, we always used to go to the same place in France. So there was a little like public area and I'd go sit and just play to myself. Yeah. And then chances were people would come talk to me and that was my way of making friends because I was nervous to go up to other people. Um, so I always kind of did that and always enjoyed playing and playing talent shows. And then Patrick, who we mentioned earlier, had the brilliant man Small Words. And in the December of 2011, they kind of said, would you like to support us? We're playing at Merv Troyd Arms. And I was like, oh my God, uh, yeah, sure. So I did a, a half an hour set to support them. I wore a, a kipper jumper, you know, kipper the dog. Yeah. That big, thick, woolly jumper that my mum had knitted. And I've never sweated more in my life. <laughs> and ever since then, I've always gigged in t-shirts. <laughs> and yeah, I could probably even still tell you the set list that I did all that way back. And then from that, I then supported them at their album launch in the April. Yeah. And then, yeah, then I was just looking for money. And I put out on Facebook, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm 18, I need to make some money. And a couple of people kind of said, look, if you get 30 songs together or whatever, try gigging. And I thought, well, how do you do that? How do you just go back doing it? Well, my old guitar teacher had just set up a little mini agency, putting people in, in pubs uh, around Halifax and Rippendern and the like. So I had a bit of money from uh, my grandma passing, so I bought all this new gear, and it was like the most money I'd ever spent in my life, and I, I bought this setup. And sure enough, Richard kind of started getting me these gigs. So, yeah, the first one was eight years ago in May, and it was at the Sun Inn in Lightcliff. Yeah. Um, and I think I did maybe like four more that year at different pubs. And then I went to uni in Liverpool, and obviously that just lifted it all, and, you know, did quite a few over there. And then more and more and more. Then I came out of it for a bit and went into the pub trade, uh, just, you know, working bars and stuff. And then 2017, I got back into the circuit, I'd really just kind of decided that that was what I was going to do seriously to support trying to be an actor, trying to be a teacher, trying to be everything else. So, yeah, I do kind of two or three a weekend now, most weekends. Um, and up until lockdown, that was brilliant and a great yeah. way for me to earn my money. Um, the circuit's brilliant. There's so many talented performers. And then you get into lockdown and all of a sudden, that's the only way you earn your money. And it's a bit, ah, yeah. scary. Uh, you, you can't did, get furlough. <laughs> no, because you, you do a lot of uh, live gig, like live streamed. Yeah, gigs so that's now. that was something when when uh, lockdown seemed imminent, I was trying to think to myself, what could I do? And that was an idea that came to me, and I thought, oh great, brilliant. And then I got ill, and while I was ill, uh, I saw quite a few performers doing it. So in a way, there was a little bit of kind of jealousy because, oh damn, I was going to do that. But then I realised, actually, no, it's making it a normal form of gigging. Yeah. Whereas if kind of only one person did it, people would be like, That's, is that a bit weird? And what's great now is you can log on to Facebook and there are so many people doing it. There's almost like one a night. Um, but, yeah, so I, I take on to Facebook. I was doing Instagram as well, but yeah. the uh, the live medium doesn't work as well on Instagram. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I play every Sunday, 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. And I attach a little PayPal um, link to it. And if people want to, they can donate like a little tip jar. And 20% of that goes to the NHS. And you know what? People have absolutely astounded me with how generous they can be. Um, and it's great because my parents obviously live abroad, so they don't get to see me gig. Uh, neither do their friends that kind of live in the same country. So a lot of them are kind of tuning in as well. Um, got a lot of friends that maybe don't see me gig around here that are now tuning in. Um, but yeah, I, it's absolutely baffled me how generous people have been and how supportive and yeah. So um, obviously, with having to do live streams now, yeah, how does that compare to um, live gigs in terms of preparation? Like how do you prepare for a live stream compared to doing a live performance? Uh, the pros, I'd say. I, um, I have my computer in front of me when I'm playing, obviously. So request taking is even easier because quite often when you're playing in a pub or somebody in my standard of kind of guitar playing, and by that I mean a poor standard, 
because I never, never, ever practiced guitar as a teenager. Yeah. You can do the um, four chord song perfectly. Four chord song. Four chords gets gets you through everything. At a push, three chords gets you through most things. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you know, somebody could come up to you and say, "Oh, can you sing um, Mr. Brightside?" I mean, I do do Mr. Brightside, but if you know the song in your head, um, fair enough. But you might not know the guitar part. Whereas if somebody requests a song and you can search it on the internet, da, 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 um, it, it makes it so much easier. So the request taking side of the show has been really good. And that's encouraged a lot of people to kind of tune in a bit more. Um, and I've been taking requests before the shows and trying to learn those to some standard, which again brings people into the show. But the interaction side is all, is weird. Yeah. So it's so hard to judge if a crowd are enjoying it because you, in a pub, everyone's singing along or hopefully everybody's singing along and dancing along, smiling. All you've got on a stream, if you can keep up with it, is that little comment thread. Yeah. And yeah, you do try and keep up with it, but it it's just not the same at all. And you're trying to look out for requests in there and and it's really weird. So you'll, you'll do a... Yeah, a song like Mr. Brightside that everybody sings along with normally at a gig. It's one of those songs that people will still sing in 80 years' time, you know. Yeah. And you'll play that and you're so used to this big noise and then you finish and it's this real cacophony, really. It's beautiful and yeah. everyone kind of has closure at the end of it. But I feel you don't get that closure where you're just playing it on your own in your living room yeah. and you look up and there's nobody there and yeah. it's weird, really weird. I had a same thing because uh, I did a friends quiz for work and I think about six teams turned up. Yeah. But it was just random noises throughout that I could hear while trying to give the questions. And it was probably the most weirdest thing I've ever done. I did it at the start of lockdown, literally the week after we got locked down. Yeah. And I've not done one since because it was bloody awful. It's just strange, isn't it? It's a it, it's become it's become normal to me now. I think I think my yeah. first gig back will be weird. Mm. It'll be annoying having um, drunk people coming up again yeah. and like getting in your face because at least like, whoa, two, day, two meters. Yeah, on, on, on a live stream, you can kind of just like mute somebody, can't you? Or even yeah. on a Zoom call. Yeah, you know, I've hosted quizzes on a Zoom call. Just no, I'm muting that person because the same things I don't hear. Um, so that'll be weird going back. But I mean, God knows when we'll go back into that world. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're in the wrong professions. Yeah, I've had I've had a request from people abroad that, that have watched the streams to kind of do one one a month anyway after lockdown. Yeah, um, and it makes me wonder like how much of life is going to go digital after. I, I reckon working. quite a lot. I, I think reckon. so. I think people. I think I think the people that were maybe scared of technology are realizing how safe a lot of it is. Yeah. You know, online banking and things like that. Um, and people that kind of were already doing that sort of thing, like myself, I started to realise how many more opportunities there are out there. Like, yeah, I didn't realise how easy PayPal was necessarily because yeah. the few PayPal accounts I've ever had have always been hacked and something's gone wrong. And look, actually the ease of something like a PayPal or a Monzo and things like that, it's just brilliant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, oh. I think I answered your question. Yeah, I, I think I, I forgot the question. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just one last question, really. Uh, do you have any advice for anyone wanting to start gigging? Oh, God, just just do it. Just just do it. I And, and the first ones are, are not always good. Um, I look back to... I, I had a request recently for Aerosmith. Um, don't want to miss a thing. Yeah. And I was really nervous to try it because I thought, oh, it's a high song. And uh, I remember trying it before a wedding. I didn't do it at the wedding, but I tried to practice it before a wedding in my first year of gigs. And I just couldn't reach the key, uh, the high notes. And I wasn't a skilled enough musician back then to change the key. Um, and then the other day I, I tried it. And the only bit I, I can't do because I haven't, my voice isn't trained that way, I can't be the rock screen that Steven Tyler yeah. does in the middle. You know that? Yeah, 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 um, but my voice has grown and the range has improved steadily over the years. I've not tried to reach up to that song, but naturally it does, and just practice and practice and practice and learning new styles. And um, don't ever try and set out to just do one style. 
Yeah. Like, I try everything. If somebody requests something, I'll go, yeah, I'll give it a try. It doesn't always work. But, like, I've tried rap. I've tried Disney songs. I've tried musical theatre songs. I've tried, you know, rock, um, ska, every, everything. If, if somebody requests something, I'll give it a go. And it either works for you or it doesn't. But, yeah, it just it can be as simple as just get, going from being in your room, singing along. You know, if you know somebody that gigs, you know, ask them if they'll, you know, let you go on for 20 minutes before them as a support act. Uh, don't be offended if they say no, because not all pubs and clubs like it. They don't all support having a support act. Um, but I was very lucky. I had Paddy, and I also had a guy called Max Jagger. Um, oh, yeah. He's a bit like, a, bit like a, a fake cousin. He's my god brother, I think is what you call him. His mum is my god mum. Uh, but he also, you know, let me support him a couple of times. <laughs> and it gives you that practice. But open mics are your friend. Get to open mics, as many open mics as you can. Because um, everyone's so supportive at those. I mean, we all we all did a lot of bonding around the uh, Murgatroyd Arms open mic. Yeah. And um, was it Shoulder and Mutton as well? Yeah, the Shoulder show? and Mutton, me yeah. and Jake went up there with the fabulous Mick Brown. Mick yeah. Brown's doing a lot of live streams at the moment. Really good live streams. Yeah. Uh, of Psycho Slinky's fame. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, John, the late, late John Cooper sadly lost him a couple of years ago but um, at the Merg really kick started uh, our generation of the circuit kind of me and Paddy and Jake and Rasheen and that kind of little group of us there gave us all our first chances really at uh, pub gigs uh, and I'll always be eternally grateful to him for that yeah that's some good advice. So, Todd, thank you so much for joining me today. No, oh, thanks for having me on, buddy. I've enjoyed it. It's all right. And thank you guys for tuning in for another episode of Interval Conversations. See you next time.